we're going to be talking this afternoon about affection in terms of autism. And I'm not sure, because I'm not used to talking to such a varied audience, how much information you have in your mind about autism. So I wanted to give you some uh, things to think about about autism. One is that, as an, a lovely speaker yesterday said, it's not a defect. When we do have it in DSM, which is the Encyclopedia of Mental Disorders. Don't you love that term, disorder? So at Minds and Hearts, we don't talk about, uh, we don't use the term disorder. As one boy said to me, but Michelle, there's nothing disordered about me. I'm a very ordered person. <laughs> and if you know autism, you know he's right. You know, he's, he does order beautifully. So we, t we actually talk about autism, autism spectrum conditions. And autism is a neurological condition, largely genetic, but there are many different pathways to autism. It's characterised by, and this is straight from DSM, I wouldn't normally kind of use these words, but just to be very quick, impaired social interaction. That means that these guys don't do social so well. They're, they're really good at other things, but when it comes to repairing a conversation, remembering to look at the eyes or even feel comfortable to do that, reading a face, reading the emotion in the eyes, skills that many of us take for granted, these guys are not coming equipped with the neural networks that allow them to manage these skills easily. And so they find that anything to do with socialising, whether it's attending school and being in a classroom with 30 other kids and teachers to relate to, and, and being in a job where you have a boss or um, teammates you have to smile at and say hello every day, these are huge challenges for these guys. So there's an impairment, we might say, from our neurotypical stance, an impairment in social interaction. Another side is the social communication, how well they use nonverbal communication to get the message across. So you might notice if you know someone with Asperger's syndrome, for example, a, a subtype of autism, that they speak in a monotone or don't use nuance in the tone of voice. Uh, there may be a difficulty in using the face. You know, a terrible example of this is uh, one girl who I saw for a while, unfortunately, as you can imagine, these guys in a mainstream school can be terribly bullied and teased. And this one girl related to me that she had suffered this, and you know, she said to me that the other girls in the class thought it was acceptable. She overheard one of the other girls say to her peer, oh, it's okay, you can tease her. She doesn't have any feelings. Ah, oh. oh. and you know why they thought that? Because she didn't show them on her face. She didn't have the neural networks that allowed the expression of emotion on her face. And that's a huge myth that comes along with autism spectrum conditions. It's that people think because they don't show feelings in the same way, they don't have the same feelings. And this is a huge myth. So lots, all these, all these people walking around and the statistics in Australia we use at the moment is one in a hundred. So hello to all the Aspies out there or everyone with autism because in this crowd we'll have at least seven. And um, we know that in uh, high functioning autism or Asperger's syndrome, which is what I mainly focus on, they tend to have higher average intelligence or superior intellect. And so um, the Aspies in the audience are probably going to be the ones who have um, contributed meaningfully in some way in the field of neurology or psychology, in teaching, etc. But anyway, impaired social communication is one of the issues. And lastly, restricted and repetitive behaviour is in our DSM criteria as well. All these criteria are changing uh, in May 2013, but this is where we are at the moment. Why restricted and repetitive behaviour? It's interesting. I mean, certainly the basal ganglia is involved, as was discussed yesterday, involved in how we set habits in life. There are many other neural circuits, as you can imagine, involved in the autism spectrum conditions. But you also can think that if you come into this world that's full of social zealots, what are you going to do if you don't like socialising? You've got to find something. And so you do what replenishes you. You become often very obsessive about what really floats your boat or lights your fire. You become very, very good at a specific interest, depending on your intellectual um, 
awareness and ability because autism can come along with a comorbid of intellectual impairment. And in that case, we may see more lining up of cars or different repetitive manner mannerisms, um, self-stimming, all those sorts of things. So you get an idea of what's autism. Autism is when the person has found something more interesting in life to do than socialise. <laughs> They're interested in something else. What's the common conception of autism in our, our society? Probably Rain Man, and I think he's a good person to kind of bring to mind at this point because the things that really stand out to me about this film is one when you see Rain Man, um, he's not called Rain Man, is he? He's called Dustin Hoffman. He probably even had another name in the film. But they drop the matches in the restaurant and he knows exactly how many there are. You know, these savant skills that can come along with autism. But remember the relationship he had with the Tom Cruise character. The brother, they, he, he didn't get it. He couldn't make, he couldn't forge that relationship. And in the film, initially, Tom Cruise wanted to and, and not, didn't want to forge the relationship. But then he did. But there was nothing coming back. Do you remember that? The, um, the person playing the guy with autism didn't know how to forge a relationship with his brother and may have been interested, but the film didn't really answer that. But what is Asperger's syndrome? Because we know now through research that there are many different subtypes in autism. And it, to the extent that now people are calling the subset of conditions the autisms, different uh, types, we didn't know about Asperger's syndrome because the person writing about it was writing in Austria in 1944. And at the time, the, what was going on at the time with the um, a political situation, people were not so interested in understanding about what they thought of as a disability in children at the time. So really, Hans Asperger, who was a pediatrician working in Austria, his uh, writings got lost and we didn't really know about them in the English-speaking world until 1981 where Professor Lorna Wing wrote her seminal paper and termed this uh, subset of kids who have this particular unique presentation, Asperger's Syndrome, in honour of Hans Asperger's work. What we find with kids and adults with Asperger's syndrome is, yes, they are on the autism spectrum. That's a question that's been answered well now over 20 years of research, that they generally have less social impairment than those we might think of as having autism. You know, if you think of someone with autism, classic kind of picture is the little boy or little girl in the corner, self-stimulating, no language, cut off from the social world or lining up toys. Guys with Asperger's syndrome, girls with Asperger's syndrome are out and about in the world. They have good language. They have average intellect or superior. I know he doesn't, he doesn't walk around going, I have Asperger's syndrome, and no one's diagnosed him. But I, I, th I was thinking, well, what's a picture of someone who's got Asperger's syndrome in our current social media? And it would be Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory. We recently at the clinic ran a group for guys about optimism. These are guys on the autism spectrum. They have high-functioning autism and Asperger's syndrome. And quite a few just, he is their hero. Because he's likeable, he's lovely, he, he wants to make friends, he doesn't know how. And they would wear t-shirts with the equation on it of how to make a friend. Because Sheldon worked out the mathematical equation of how to make a friend. And that's a, that's a very Aspie approach to friendship. You know, that someone will work it out one day and they'll win a Nobel Prize. Another wonderful figure to think about when you think about Asperger's syndrome, a leader in this area, is Dr. Temple Grandin. You may have heard of her because she's been in the media a lot, not only for her expertise in autism, but also because she's wonderful with cattle, cows. She's the person who has designed all these holding pens and tunnels and squeeze machines to help cows feel really good. And, and I know that sounds really funny, but it's a humane way. Like sometimes I think, oh, but you know, they're just getting really relaxed so they can be led more comfortably to the slaughterhouse. But it's a very humane, and she has been a, 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 the recipient of many medals for her humane treatment of animals. And you may know there's a wonderful film about her life, Temple Grandin, starred beautifully by Claire Danes. And I just thought it's good to have these pictures of women with Asperger's syndrome because the uh, the equation at the moment or the ratio is uh, one girl to four boys with autism or Asperger's syndrome, but the girls are definitely out there. Probably, it's probably more like um, one to two. We just don't recognise the girls yet very well. But in all of this, why the affection project? So my colleague and I, Tony Atwood, decided 
We really want to help our guys understand affection. There were clinical concerns where we found people were on the spectrum were expressing their affection too much to the wrong people at the wrong time, and that was of clinical concern. We also had the kids who were getting very anxious because if you think about how we typically, if we don't have autism or Asperger's syndrome, if we think about how we help others feel good, it's usually through words of encouragement and reassurance and a hug. It's just innate, it's what we like to do. But if you, ha if you are on the spectrum and you don't understand a hug, that's not going to be a very good way to settle that person down. So we have clinical concern for the person on the spectrum and we have parental concerns where the parents are feeling affection deprived, essentially, because they're not getting the I love yous. I, I, I'm very neurotypical, I, I'm not on the spectrum. I stand up here and I want to tell my mum I love her. I want you to you know, embrace your mums and I want to sing happy birthday to my mum. These are expressions of affection that will not come naturally to the person on the spectrum. But I want to um, talk more about, you know, I want to unpack that a bit more. Children on the autism spectrum are often not instinctive or intuitive about how they express like or loving to the people around them. And they lack the understanding, often, that their family members and friends need affection. So this is, a, this is an issue. So typical children have an understanding of how much affection to give. They understand how effective and powerful a hug can be. This lovely photograph of an 18-month-old child giving her mum a hug, because look at that mum's face, she needs a hug. That girl was 18 months old and she knew. She didn't have to sit and think about it. It comes intuitively. But for the guys on the spectrum and the girls on the spectrum, they will not necessarily have that understanding. Has, if anyone here has read the wonderful book by Mark Haddon, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, that's a really lovely book to read to understand Asperger's Syndrome. And you might remember that that little boy, I think he was 14, showed affection to his father by just a light touch on the fingertips because that's all he could stand. And he became a confused, overwhelmed, if greater levels of affection were required. He didn't understand that his dad needed a hug. He didn't get it. Some of our kids on the autism spectrum, though, need excessive reassurance, and they are desperate for reassurance, usually verbal, though, rather than affection. But if it's affection, if it's a hug, they're actually craving the, uh, the tactile experience of deep pressure. They want the deep pressure. They have uh, a different sensory processing system that affects the tactile uh, sensory input, and a light touch is, is experienced as aversive, but they want a deep cuddle. They have limited vocabulary of expressions of affection and they don't modify their expression of affection for age or status. We can think of your capacity for affection as being a bucket or a cup. So neurotypical kids, lots of affection. I'm very happy with that. But our kids on the spectrum, a cup, a little teacup is all they need. It can be an immature expression of affection, like the little preppy who wants to hug the teacher and all his friends, but now she's 12 and it's not as appropriate and, it's not, and she's really standing out. And as I said earlier, we know that these guys are not necessarily soothed by words and gestures of affection. The parent can question whether their child actually loves them or not because they're showing more affection for the pet than the parent and the parent feels affection deprived. But an interesting idea too about this is how much are our kids understanding empathy? And this has been raised a few times in, the, um, in this wonderful conference so far. Put this picture up to remind me to tell you about a little boy called Matthew who loved cats. That was his obsession. Every book you can think of about cats, he had it. He had his own cat. He was a boy whose dad lived in Sydney. He lived in Brisbane and he was going to visit his, um, his dad for the school holidays. So he gets in the car, goes to the airport, and on the way, he's, he says to his mum, you know, mum, you have to look after my cat really well. Here's a list. Mum takes the list and thinks, I know how to look after cats, and she drives him to the airport and doesn't think another thing about it until two weeks later she's in the car driving and she thinks, oh, better look at that list. Maybe I missed something. So she reads it. This, is, was, this was on Matthew's list. By the way, Matthew was eight years old when he wrote this. Number one, bask in her glory. <laughs> Number two, lavish her with pats. 
Affection, understanding affection. Number three, something about the temperature of the milk in the microwave. And number four, something about the treats. That, but, you know, think about empathy and Asperger's syndrome. This boy was autistic. And he's describing this love for his animal. And what are the two things that are most important? Affection, emotional needs, and then drinking and eating. So I think what we need to understand too about Asperger's syndrome and autism is that it's not empathy deficit, as it's so often referred to in the literature. It's actually, there are many, many um, facets of autism where we see the empathy, they have it. Temple Grandin described this as, I know how to feel love, but my brain is different. Does that make my love any different to other people's or any less um, needed? What we did, and I'll just flick through to show you, was in our affection program, we decided that what we wanted to do was through logic and activities and projects teach our guys how to show affection. And that's essentially what we did. And the, luckily in the USB you'll get a full description about what we did. But we, we practiced, we showed people how to listen, how to spend fun time with each other, how to give hugs. We identified problem areas and we taught the guys to be able to cope with affection and how to express it. We got good results, which I don't have any pretty graphs, but I'll just tell you we're really happy. There's more randomized control trials going on because of the encouraging results we're having. With I think what we're doing is we're stimulating um, the parts of the brain that understand empathy, and we're helping the guys understand how to use empathy, affection, and love. And what we found is it. It's a wonderfully successful program. It's only suggestive because we, as you would have seen in one of my slides, we actually just did it with 21 of our guys. But I wanted to end with this lovely quote from Scott, age 13, who said, thank you for the group. I think I would have been dateless the whole of my life if you had not taught me the value of empathy. And I just felt, wow, as much as we've helped this boy in his family express love and affection to his parents, he will make such lovely partner. This is where we're heading for our guys on the spectrum to be able to have that intimacy and that love in their relationships in adulthood as well. And I'm sorry, that's all I have time for. It goes so quickly, but thank you.